Good day, class. This will be our first lecture for our introduction to the New Testament. Now, in the last semester, we spoke about the Old Testament, and we will have to continue some important themes that we have not discussed in the Old Testament because they are very important in the understanding of the New Testament. Now, if you were faithful to our uh, assigned videos, our Bible Project videos, we ended our lecture, the part uh, in the Old Testament last semester, in the book of Deuteronomy, which speaks about the transition of the people of Israel from their escape from Egypt, from their being a wandering tribe, to their entry into the promised land. So in the book of Deuteronomy, it speaks about the death of Moses and the succession of Joshua as the new leader of the people of Israel. And they crossed the Jordan River. Uh, they, in the book of Judges, we discussed that they uh, attacked the local inhabitants, the Canaanites, and they entered into the promised land, and they settled into the promised land, not as a kingdom, not as a united nation, but rather as a united confederation of different tribes. Remember that the people of Israel are composed of the 12 tribes of Israel. These are the 12 sons of uh, Israel. Uh, and so they settled there as a confederation of different tribes, and it is only later on that the people of Israel become a kingdom. During our last meetings, uh, in the introduction to the New Testament, I asked you to watch some YouTube videos, the Bible Project videos, and they continue the story. So I asked you to watch Samuel 1 and 2, the book of Kings, and the prophet Isaiah. So uh, those videos are very important for you to understand this lecture. And so please, if you haven't watched them yet, please check them out in YouTube. Nasa group chat naman po natin yung mga links. And watch them first so that you can have a better grasp of our understanding of the concept of the Davidic Covenant and the Messiah. And so, after how many hundreds of years, the different tribes of Israel decided that they wanted to have a king who will rule over them. Originally, Israel was what we call a Theocracy. It was mean they are ruled by God. God was their king, and God sent judges, prophets, to represent him and speak God's will to the different tribes of Israel. But there came a point when Israel wanted to have a living, visible king whom they look up to as their king. Now, the Old Testament has an ambivalent attitude towards the idea of monarchy. It was mean parang hati yung pagkaintindi ng Old Testament sa isang hari. On one side, as you have watched it in the book of Samuel, it was seen as something bad, no? something negative. It was a, parang they rejected Samuel, they rejected God as their king, and they wanted to have their own king. So kingship, the monarchy, was seen as something negative, something bad. But at the same time, also in the same Old Testament, we would see passages where this monarchy, the kingship, which is a, a form of betrayal of their faith in God as their king, also became something positive. In other words, out of something initially negative, something bad, God makes something very positive out of it. God brings out a greater good out of this monarchy, which was initially, yun nga, hindi maganda, yung pag-intindi. So, it, it shows us that sometimes there are many things in our life na initially mali, nagkamali tayo. But somehow, some way, God turns this thing into something very positive. It becomes a very big blessing. Uh, in the past, I was able to speak to somebody who would like to have an abortion kasi parang sabi niya the baby was a mistake isang pagkakamali yun and sabi ko sa kanya isang pagkakamali okay isang bunga ng pagkakamali pero wag mo nang dagdagan yung pagkakamali mo ng another pagkakamali by making an abortion because we can never know how God would how God would direct your life who knows in the future itong pagkakamaling ito could be the source of blessing for your life in the future. 
if only you learn to trust God, that He will correct this seemingly pagkakamali at this point in time. So here in the story of David, especially in the Davidic covenant, we will see how the kingship, which was initially frowned at, which was initially bad, became the source of so much good in the history of Israel and in salvation history in itself. Because something that can start off as something bad can turn out to be something good if only we learn how to trust in God. And so let's dive into our lecture this day. So, we know as Christians that the idea of the Messiah is very important. When you talk about the Messiah, una natin inisip, it's Jesus Christ. However, you see that the idea of the Messiah is not something static. It's something that is developing. It progressed its understanding as salvation history unfolded. So initially, iba yung pagkaintindi ng Old Testament sa konsepto ng Messias. No? So, nagde-develop yung konsepto ng Messias. So we will try to understand now the development of the concept of the Messiah. And I want you to take note of the development because this will be your assignment for this week. So we have to understand the development. So the Messiah simply means the anointed one. He who is anointed. So anointing is the pouring of oil, or smearing of oil on your forehead or on your head, which is a symbol of blessing of God that you have been chosen by God. In the Old Testament, those who were anointed were of course the priests, the prophets, but particularly in our understanding of the Messiah, it refers to the anointing of kings. And so of course we know that Saul, the first king of Israel, was anointed as king, but he did not turn out so well, no? so he was rejected by God. So this is what an anointing looks like. So a Messiah is somebody who is anointed. Particularly, we are focusing on the anointing of David as the new king of Israel after Saul. So this is a story of Samuel, the prophet Samuel. God sent Samuel to Jesse, the father of David, because God says that one of the sons of Jesse will be the next king of Israel. So, of course, present me Jesse, lahat ng anak niya, pero wala doon sa mga present niya. Because there's one more son who was tending the flocks, nagpapasto. And so Samuel said, send for him, we will not sit down until he arrives, this youngest son. So he sent for him, for David, and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So the story goes, you can watch the Bible project for the succeeding story. So in other words, David is the anointed one. He is the king of Israel, chosen one of God to lead the people of Israel. He was anointed and he received the spirit of the Lord upon him. So you know first level ng pag-intindi natin sa Messiah. Now of course we know the story of David. It's in the Bible project. There came a time when David already rested, when he was given rest by the Lord from all his enemies. He was already established. Uh, initially, uh, Jerusalem was not the capital of Israel. In fact, it was a Jebusite capital. So it's not part of the confederation of tribes of Israel. So David chose that as his capital. That would be the capital of the new kingdom of Israel. So David set forth when he was already king conquer Jerusalem and make it make it as his new capital. So Jerusalem is a hill, it's a fortress. So mahirap siyang asakupin sapagkat it's, the city is established on a hill. So mataas na lugar. So when the Lord uh, granted rest to David, he was king over Jerusalem, the new capital of Israel. <laughs> David decided to build a temple for the Lord. And it is in this point in the scriptures where we see the covenant with David. 
So of course, we already discussed what a covenant it is. It is a establishment of a special relationship between God and the people of Israel. And now we see an establishment of a special relationship between God and the family of David. So the covenant with David and his house. And here we will also see the development of the idea of the Messiah. So in Samuel 7, David said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in the house of Cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Ibig sabihin, walang templo. Nasa tent lang yung ark of the covenant. And so David wanted to build a temple for God. Why? First level, because it's out of devotion for God. At the same time, building a temple in Jerusalem as the official place of worship would somehow be a form of unifying the different tribes of Israel. The whole 12 tribes of Israel will now have to look to Jerusalem as the only uh, legitimate place of worship. So every year they would go to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. And so it was a form of, it was in one sense religious, it was out of the piety and love of David for God. At the same time, it was also political, it was also social. So this was the response of Nathan after a dream. So Nathan said, or rather God said to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers who commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? So sabi ni Lord, Ikaw ba ang gagawa ng bahay para sa akin? I never asked for a house. The whole time I was traveling with Israel, I never asked for a house. <coughs> and this is continuation. I took you, David, from the pasture, from tending the flock, and over my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the great men on earth. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. <coughs> so take note. There are different things that are important here. God promises that he will make David great. He will make the name of David great. And remember, uh, in the covenant with Abraham, that's one of the promises God gave to Abraham. So we see here a fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham, the forefather of David, because God will now make... Next significant thing we have to notice is the fact that the term house is used many times, but with different meaning. Kumbaga, parang sarcastic pa nga si Lord nung sinagot niya si David. Sabi niya, ikaw ba talaga sure ka ang gagawa ng house para sa akin? Pero hindi, ako ang gagawa ng house para sa iyo. Pero umiba ang ibig sabihin ng house sa different statements na yun. And we continue with the text. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, the first king, whom I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure before me. Your throne will be established forever. And so this is the text of the covenant God makes with David. And as you can observe, there's a shift or a change in the meaning of the term house. In one level, house refers to, of course, bahai. And particularly in that particular point in history, it refers to the house that David wants to build for God, which is the temple. At the same time, house also changed its meaning. God will build a house for David. And if you have watched the very popular and epic HBO series, The Game of Thrones, which had a very disappointing ending, we know that house is used in a different sense. Meron sila tinatawag na House Targaryen or House Stark. And house refers to the different ruling families in the seven kingdoms. So, in the text of the Bible, it has this meaning. House refers to the dynasty of David. So when God says, I will build the house for you, it means that it is a promise of an eternal dynasty or family or kingdom for David that will rule over Jerusalem. So ngayon sa ating panahon, yung salitang dynasty ay parang may negative connotation because we think about political dynasties. Now however, in the ancient times, dynasty was something very important because a dynasty is the continuous line of succession of kings. Remember that in ancient world, in the ancient world, and especially in ancient Israel, the king was a symbol of unity. It was a symbol of stability of the kingdom. The 12 tribes of Israel looked to the king in Jerusalem as the symbol of the unity of their kingdom, of their nation. And whenever a new son is born to a king, pag may anak ang king, ibig sabihin magpapatuloy ang lahi ng king at magkakaroon ng next king, at magkakaroon ng next king, and next king. And ibig sabihin, magpapatuloy ang kaharian, magpapatuloy ang stability ng kaharian. Now, if a king does not have a son, na puto lang dynasty, when the king dies, who will be the next leader? And what's gonna happen is, the different generals of the king, the different ministers, the different lords of the, of the kingdom, will fight each other to take control of the kingdom. And there will be political unrest, there will be civil war. Masisira ang stability ng kaharian. And possibly, mahahati-hati ang kaharian. That's why the promise that the kingdom will last, that there will be a lasting dynasty, is a promise that the kingdom of Israel, that the kingdom of David, would last forever. So it's a promise of stability. It's a promise of God's abiding presence in the kingdom. Let's take note. Again, the Lord declares to you, David, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. And it is he, your son, who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he does wrong, I will punish him, but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So these are the terms of the covenant. Again, a covenant, meron isang kasunduan. God swears to David that your kingdom, your house, will be forever. And God himself will be a father to the house of David. So remember that a covenant, one good analogy for the covenant is adoption. So God now adopts not only the whole people of Israel, but particularly the king and his sons after him as God's own son. 
So there are very significant features in the Davidic Covenant. <clears throat> Take note that the Davidic Covenant, David's line will have a kingdom. In Psalm 89, verse 27, sinasabi, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. The covenant is made with David's whole dynasty, with David's whole bloodline. <clears throat> Next features of the Davidic covenant. David is anointed, is adopted as God's own son. In Psalm 2, verse 7, it says, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And this psalm is often referred to David and his dynasty, his bloodline. Another feature is that the covenant is unlimited. It's everlasting. It's forever. Hindi na siya masisira itong covenant na to. And we see that Jerusalem becomes the spiritual and political center of Israel and of the whole, uh, of the whole salvation history. In Psalm 2, it says, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now, Zion is the hill. Uh, there are different layers of meaning in the term Zion. Zion can refer to the hill in Bundok, kung saan nakatayo yung city of Jerusalem. Zion can refer to the city of Jerusalem itself, the city of David. Or Zion can also refer to the mountain on which the temple of the Lord is built upon. And so Zion can also mean the temple of the Lord. So maraming meaning yung word na Zion. So kailangan sensitive kayo. What is the meaning of the term when it is being used? In Isaiah chapter 2, it says, For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So it is only during the time of David that Jerusalem, that Zion, becomes a very significant religious symbol. If you read the earlier part of the, of the Old Testament, hindi nag appear in Jerusalem, hindi significant in Jerusalem. Only during the time of David does Jerusalem, Jerusalem become the capital, the spiritual and the political capital of Israel. And of course, the temple is the sign of the Davidic Covenant. It's the physical symbol of the Davidic Covenant. <clears throat> so here we see there's a development of the concept of Messiah. No? The Messiah is not just the anointed king, but he is the anointed king who will continue the bloodline of David, who rules over the people of Israel in Jerusalem. He is the symbol of the continuity of the kingdom. He is the symbol of God's blessing and presence in the people of Israel. So makita nung nagde-develop na naman yung concept ng Messiah. And if you're going to read the text, the Messiah is actually none other than the offspring who will succeed you, your own flesh and blood. I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And who is this son of David? Who built the temple. Of course, hindi si David ang nag-build ng temple. Hindi siya, hindi siya pinili ng Diyos, kundi yung anak ni David. And who is that? He's none other than King Solomon, the son of David. So you see, in the development of the concept of Messiah, here we realize or we see that actually it is Solomon who is the Messiah because it is Solomon who will continue the bloodline of David it is Solomon who will build the temple of the Lord, which is again the symbol of the covenant with David. So we see there is a development of the concept of the Messiah. And of course, all the other kings succeeding Solomon will be considered as Messiah because they continue the bloodline of David. <clears throat> so we see uh, <clears throat> during the time of David and during the time of Solomon, ito yung kumbaga golden years ng kingdom nila. Ito yung golden years ng Israel because it was a time of prosperity, it was a time of union, unification, peace, stability, and strength. And damang-dama ng mga tao yung blessing ng Diyos sa nila. So, if you look at the text succeeding after the story of David and Solomon, they will always be looking back to the time of David, to the time of Solomon, when there was unity, when there was peace. Kasi masisira yung unity and peace na yun.
as we will see later. So the Messiah is a, a symbol of the continuity of this golden age. He's a symbol of the continuity. He's rather the fulfillment of the promise, the continuity of the kingdom of David. So Solomon succeeds David as king of Israel and builds the temple of God in Jerusalem. However, after Solomon's death, Israel was divided in two kingdoms. The kingdom of Israel in the north, and the capital is in Samaria, and the kingdom of Judah in the south. The capital is Jerusalem. Jeroboam uh, if we will read uh, the Bible, Jeroboam is a minister, a very important minister of Solomon, who when Solomon dies, he will rebel against the family of David and build his own kingdom. And he will call this the kingdom of Israel. And so ito yung northern side. So he rebelled against Jerusalem, established a capital in Samaria, and makes a new temple with a golden calf. So we will see that actually after the golden age of David and then continued by Solomon, because of the sins of Solomon, as you will see in the Bible Project video, God punishes Israel as a whole. So, mahahati at Israel between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The ten tribes of Israel will belong to the northern kingdom and they will call themselves as the kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom, they call themselves the kingdom of Judah. And so the kings of the southern kingdom are the descendants of David. Ang Jerusalem ang magpapatuloy ng dynasty ni David. But the northern kingdom, which will be called the kingdom of Israel, ito yung kumbaga nag against the family of David. At hindi na po mayuunite ulit itong kingdom na to. And this is because of the sins of the kings in Jerusalem, because of the sin of Solomon and the sins of the succeeding kings after Solomon. And so, the focus now will no longer be in the whole of Israel, but the focus of the story will now be here in the kingdom of Judah. The promise of the covenant will continue here, the south the kings of Jerusalem, who will rule over Jerusalem. So Jerusalem will continue to be the uh, capital of the kingdom of Judah. Jerusalem will continue to be the capital of the descendants of David, the dynasty of David. They will still rule in Jerusalem. While the north Israel, ito yung mga rebel And you will see that they will actually establish their, their capital here in Samaria. And because, again, the temple is a symbol of uh, unity, Samaria, the kingdom of Israel, had to establish its own temple. Because if Jerusalem is still the temple that people worship, baka later on mag-shift ang allegiance ng mga people, ng mga ten tribes, and they will start to return back to the tribe of Judah. And that was something that Jeroboam understood. So political move ito, he had to establish his own temple. And in that temple in Samaria, they put up a golden calf, an idol to replace the God of Israel and to replace the temple in Jerusalem. And all the kings who will succeed Jeroboam will all be very wicked kings. So all of this happened around 1000 BC. David became king around 1,010 years before Christ. Solomon becomes king around 970 years, something like that, before Christ. And then after the death of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel is divided into two. The north, called as the kingdom of Israel, here. The south, the kingdom of Judah. So, Makikita natin na magde-develop na naman ang konsepto ng Messiah. So, hundreds and hundreds of years later, 
after the time of the division of the empire, of the kingdom, Syria joined forces with the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, to attack the southern kingdom of Judah in 731 BC, or 731 years before Christ. So, remember, ang focus ng kwento ngayon ay nasa south na. Ito magpapatuloy sa dynasty ni David. Ito magpapatuloy ng covenant. So, ito, northern Israel, masama na to, kalaban na to. So, itong northern Israel na to, will you like with another foreign country to attack the south? At that time, King Ahaz was the king in Jerusalem. So, King Ahaz of Judah, a descendant of David, was facing defeat and almost certain destruction when in his desperate situation, Isaiah the prophet was given a sign from God that he had not abandoned Judah because of God's covenant with David. So in this particular point in history where there was a political turmoil, patuloy pa rin yung pangako ng Diyos na he will be with the family of David. And it is to the prophet Isaiah that he will give a sign. And what is that sign? We now move to the next phase of the history of the people of God with a particular focus on the book of the prophet Isaiah. So I hope you watched the video on the book of the prophet Isaiah because here we see the story of King Ahaz and the new meaning of the word Messiah. So, uh, of course, uh, Ahaz was very afraid kasi baka sasakupin na siya ng kalaban niya sa north, yung northern Israel, at ng Syria. However, the, the prophet Isaiah was sent to the king with this message. So in Isaiah 7, it says, The Lord says, It will not take place. It will not happen. It will be in, uh, the kingdom of Judah will not be destroyed. It will not, be, it will not happen. Hindi masisira ang kingdom of Judah. Within 65 years, Ephraim, referring to the northern kingdom, will be too shattered to be a people. Be firm in your faith. You will not, if you are not firm, sorry, there's a missing text here. If you are not firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. So Isaiah pro prophesies that the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, na ngayon ang kalaban na, within 65 years after the time, ay masisira na, mawawasak na. And Isaiah tells King Ahaz to be firm in your faith because if you are not firm in your faith, you cannot stand. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. So sabi ni Lord, sige, humingi ka ng sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Anong response ni Isaiah dito? Magagalit si Isaiah actually. Sabi ni Isaiah, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of God also? So sabi ni Isaiah, hindi pa ba sapat na uh, pabigat na kayo sa bayan ng, ng Israel? Pati ang Diyos ba magiging pabigat kayo sa Diyos? Why? Because Ahaz said, I will not ask for a sign. Why? Because Ahaz did not want to trust in God. Rather, he wanted to make an alliance, a political alliance, with other kingdoms to help him against uh, the kingdom of Israel, northern kingdom. But Isaiah says, hindi, magtiwala ka lang sa Diyos. Hindi mo na kailangan gumawa ng political alliance sa ibang mga bayan. Ang Diyos ang magliligtas sa iyo. And so, <clears throat> Isaiah rebukes uh, Ahaz, and Isaiah says, Ayaw mo humingi ng sign, ha? Ito. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The two kings refer to the king, of course, of Israel and the allies of Israel, of the northern kingdom. Masisira itong dalawang kingdom na to. 
Now, Emmanuel, of course, we know it means God with us. And the term Emmanuel is added to the meaning of Messiah. Now when you think of Messiah, you think of Emmanuel. You think a promise that God will be with us, that God is with us, and God will remain with us. So the question is, Ahaz is assured by God's covenant to David. Because Ahaz is a descendant of David, pinapangako ng Diyos na hindi matitinag ang house of David. And because Ahaz is part of the house of David, so Ahaz need not fear because God will be with them. Because of this Emmanuel. Now, <clears throat> this term, no, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Actually, in the original Hebrew, the term for virgin is Alma, which translates as a young woman. <clears throat> a young woman can also refer to a young wife, a young bride. However, when the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, this term Alma was translated as Parthenos, which means virgin. And the Greek Bible, the Greek Old Testament, was the version of the Bible which the early Christians read. It was the version of the Bible that the early writers of the Gospel read. And so whenever the writers of the Gospel read the Old Testament, they always read the word Parthenos, virgin. That's why later on, this term will be the Emmanuel. Uh, this term, this or rather this phrase, will be interpreted by the New Testament people, by the Christians, as a prophecy for the coming of Jesus Christ who will be born of the Virgin, the Blessed Virgin Mary. But in the original Hebrew, the term is Alma, a young woman. And a young woman can refer to a young bride or a young wife. Now, you may ask, Paano nangyari yun? E di nagpumiba yung meaning, nagkaroon ng mistranslation. E di, pumiba na yung meaning ng text. So for us Christians, we believe that it's part of the inspiration of God, that somehow the translation of the term from Alma to Parthenos uh, revealed or unveiled an even deeper meaning of the prophecy. So makikita mo, there are different layers of meaning in the text, different layers of meaning in the prophecy. In one level, the prophecy refers to a particular event in that particular point in history. At the same time, the prophecy also refers to something far, far, far greater. It refers to Jesus Christ whom Ahaz, as the king, probably could never have known, and probably Isaiah himself could not have fully known ano ba talaga ang meaning, ang full meaning ng prophecy. So makikita mo, a prophecy has different layers of meaning. So, <clears throat> let's now focus on the particular meaning of this prophecy in that point in history. So who is the young maiden, the young maiden, who will conceive and give birth to a son? And this son will be called Emmanuel. Uh, different translators have different interpretations. One is that it could refer to the wife of Isaiah himself who was giving birth to a son. But the more plausible meaning is the wife of the king, King Ahaz himself, will have a son. And so makikita mo dito, it's, a con it's like David again. God promises that the kingdom of David would last by promising that David would have a son who will build the temple of the Lord. Ito naman, Isaiah promises King Ahaz that your kingdom will last. And the promise, the sign, is because your wife will give birth to a son, and this son will continue your reign, will continue the house of David. And this son will be a sign, a symbol, a fulfillment of the promise that God is with them. God is with them, and God will forever be with them. So in Hebrew, this young woman can refer to the king's young wife who will bear a son. And who is this son? He will later be King Hezekiah. So we see here that actually the Messiah, the Emmanuel, is Hezekiah, the son of King Ahaz, who is a promise, a symbol of the promise of the Lord, na hindi babagsak ang kingdom ng Jerusalem. Hindi babagsak ang house of David. Magpapatuloy, it will continue. Emmanuel, 
God is with us, Hezekiah is the Emmanuel. A promise of God's abiding presence and protection to the family of David and to Jerusalem. And true enough, in 722 BC, as the prophet Isaiah predicted, the northern kingdom of Abra of Israel, yung kalaban ni Hezekiah, was destroyed by the Assyrians, resulting in the so-called the lost ten tribes of Israel. So mawawala na yung ten tribes of Israel, dalawang tribes na maiwan, which is the southern kingdom. So na-fulfill na yung promise, yung prophecy na Isaiah, na yung mga kings na kinakakatakutan ni Ahaz ay babagsak. And second, interestingly, itong buong northern Israel na to, sasakupin na sila ng kaharian ng Assyria. At tanging ang kingdom of Judah lang ang mag-survive. And that happened in 722 BC. Why? Why did God abandon the ten tribes of Israel? Because of the wickedness of their kings. Because the ten tribes in the north, they abandoned the worship of the true God and they worship idols. Because they live a life of immorality against the teachings of God. And so God punished them. And this is what happened. But in 7010 or 01, BC, that's as you see, after the fall of Israel in 722, about 20 years later, the Assyrians, those who destroyed the northern kingdom under King Sennacherib, laid siege on Jerusalem. Hindi na contento Assyria na sakupin ang northern Israel, kundi ngayon pati Jerusalem gusto nilang sakupin. So King Hezekiah who is the Emmanuel, the son of King Ahaz, siya king ngayon, and all Israel prayed that the Lord would save them. And what happens? Because Hezekiah is the Emmanuel, because Hezekiah is the, the Messiah, the Lord will do something very great. So ganito po yung tura ng siege. So this is just a, a picture I saw from the internet. So napalibutan po yung Jerusalem, of course, Jerusalem is a fortress. It's a, it's a very bold city. Pinalibutan sila ng mga kaaway nila who wanted to attack inside. However, we read in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 13 to 19. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, okay, buhay pa po si Isaiah sa panahon nito. So long life po si Isaiah. Patay na po si Ahaz, pero si Isaiah, buhay pa. Sent a message to Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have heard your prayer concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the word the Lord has spoken against him. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. But the way that he came, he will return. By the way he came, he will return. He will not enter the city of Jerusalem, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Take note, why does God protect Jerusalem and the family of David? Because of his promise to David. Because he made a covenant with David. And you see, the Lord is very faithful to his covenants. Next. And so, as the text says, as Second Kings says, that night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the Lord got up, when the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh, his capital, and stayed there. So even if the Assyrians laid siege to Jerusalem, hindi nila nasakop ang Jerusalem itself kasi God sent a punishing angel to the people of Assyria. And so it's a symbol that truly Emmanuel, God is with the house of David, God is with Jerusalem. 
And so you may say that this is just some story that you read in the Bible, hindi naman talaga totoo ito, walang historical fact. However, archaeologists have discovered this prism of the kingdom of Assyria, which tells the story of the conquest of Assyria. And so in this prism of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, we see here it mentions actually his conquest of the kingdom of Judah. So of course, if you look at the map, going back, <coughs> this is the territory of the kingdom of Judah. Assyria was able to enter into this territory and laid waste to the different kings, uh, different cities and villages of Judah. However, hindi nila nasakop ang Jerusalem itself, ang capital. And so, as long as the capital stands, the kingdom stands. And so, of course, in this prism, the Assyrian historians told their version of the story. And of course, dahil sila na kwento, sila ang bida. And so we see here, this is the text, part of the text in the prism. So ito yung nakasulat sa prism. As to Hezekiah the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke, referring to Sennacherib. And so I laid siege to his strong cities, walled forts, and countless small villages. Himself, Hezekiah, I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. I surrounded him with earthworks in order to molest those who were his city's gates. Thus, I reduced his country. But I still increase the tribute and the presence to me as overlord, which I imposed upon him beyond the former tribute to be delivered annually. So we see here, from the perspective of the Assyrians, they surrounded Jerusalem, they laid siege to Jerusalem, and Hezekiah was like a bird in the cage. However, if you read the text, you read the prism, hindi nila sinabi na nasakop nilang Jerusalem. They were not able to destroy Jerusalem. So okay, they, they surrounded Jerusalem and Hezekiah was like a bird in a cage. Pero hindi nila napatumba ang Jerusalem. And that is a symbol of God's abiding presence in the kingdom of Jerusalem. And according to a text, to this research I did, in Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh, was decorated with reliefs depicting, depicting his campaigns and victories, including many details, the siege of Lachish. But Jerusalem never appears among them. So may mga carvings po sa palace ni Sennacherib sa Nineveh. At dun sa markings, sa mga carvings, makikita mo yung iba't ibang mga cities na sinira ni Sennacherib. Pero yung Jerusalem, hindi mo mahahanap sa mga carvings na yun sapagkat hindi nila nasira ang kingdom, ang Jerusalem. And so truly, God was faithful to His promise to Hezekiah. Hezekiah is a symbol, a fulfillment of the promise that God will not abandon the house of David, that Jerusalem, the walled city of David, will not fall. And truly, yun po ang nangyari. So God is faithful to His promises. So we move on and study further the book of the prophet Isaiah. And we see many passages referring to the Messiah. No? So here is one passage which refers to the Messiah. So sabi na Isaiah, this is a poem actually. A shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from these roots a bud shall blossom. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Again, remember in David in the text, Referring to David's anointing, it says after David was anointed that the Spirit of the Lord rests upon him. So it is characteristic of the Messiah that the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So ano ba tong stump shall sprout the stump of Jesse? Na binabasa natin sa ating liturgy every Christmas season, every Advent season, no? Because it refers to Jesus Christ. But during that time, it refers to the Messiah who is Hezekiah. Ito po yung stamp. Ito yung tinatawag natin stamp. So yung puno na pinutol, ito yung natira yung stamp. So, a shoot shall sprout from the stamp of Jesse. Who is Jesse? Of course, Jesse is the father of 
David. So the stump refers to the house of David. So it refers to the corruption in the family of David. Uh, my corruption na, my destruction na sa family of David because they have not been faithful to their covenant to God. However, there is a promise that a shoot shall sprout. Kahit patay na, corrupt na ang pamilya ni David, ang dynasty ni David, there is still hope. A new plant will blossom. And a bud shall sprout from its root. Ito pa yung bud. Yung parang about to mag-open a flower. And this bud is the Messiah. And as we have seen, this bud refers to Hezekiah, the Emmanuel. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. Not by appearance shall he judge, nor by hearsay shall he decide. The leopard will lay down with the goat. During the time of the Messiah, the leopard will lay down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a child will lead them. The cow will feed by the bear. The young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play by the cobra's den. And the young child will put its hand on the viper's nest. Take note, an infant, a young child, will play with the snake, with the cobra, with the viper. If you remember, in the Garden of Eden, there was peace. There was no quarrel among animals and humans, but the animals were subject to humans. And so it's actually a prophecy of a time na parang babalik tayo sa panahon ng Garden of Eden. Babalik tayo sa panahon ng paradise. Remember, after the sin of Adam and Eve, there was a, a rapture, a quarrel between humans and snakes. So, we say prophecy that we will go back to a time before the fight between humans and snakes when the snakes were just submissive to humans. Kasi remember, sabi sa Genesis, I will put an enmity, a separation, a quarrel between you and the snake. So, itong prophecy nito refers back to a pre, uh, pre-fall, pre-Adam and Eve fall era when there was peace between humans and animals. And of course, uh, dito mo makikita na yung actually yung prophecy about the Messiah, itong a shoot shall sprout na stop Jesse. It talks about something more than just Hezekiah. It talks about something more than just the king who will rule in Jerusalem. It talks about a different kind of Messiah. In one level, it refers to Hezekiah, who is the promised Messiah, who will continue the reign of David, the house of David. But at the same time, the prophecy also looks forward to something more. No? It's not just an ordinary human Messiah. It refers to a Messiah who is greater, who will bring us back to a time before the fall of Adam and Eve. And who is that Messiah? Find out in our next lectures. Of course, alam niyo na kung sino yun. So, hundreds of years later, after the death of Hezekiah, and then his son will succeed him, and so on and so forth, in 587 BC or 586 BC, the Babylonians, a new kingdom, under King Nebuchadnezzar will be successful in destroying the temple in Jerusalem and exile the aristocrats and the able-bodied people of Jerusalem as slaves in Babylon. So true enough, uh, the Lord was faithful to his promise to King Ahaz that the Emmanuel, Hezekiah, will be a sign that God is with them and Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled. However, because the family of the house of David, the succeeding kings, were all unfaithful to God, they did not trust God, but they trusted their own political schemes, uh, making alliances with other nations, and uh, accepting their, their practices and worshipping their gods. There came to a point where God had to somehow abandon 
his people. He abandoned Jerusalem to the Babylonians, who in 587 or 586 destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed, destroyed the temple. And if you have read the Bible, if you have watched the Bible Project video, this historical event was already prophesied by Isaiah to King Hezekiah. And so after this experience of exile, there will be a new development of the concept of the Messiah. Magbabago na naman yung ibig sabihin, mag evolve mag develop at magiging mas rich yung meaning ng Messiah. And so that ends our lecture for this day. Next week, we will continue this lecture. And so for your activity this week, <clears throat> I want you to write an essay. <coughs> so write an essay entitled, The Development of the Understanding of the Messiah. It can be one to two pages, minimum one page, of course, maximum of two pages. Font, Times New Romans, 12. Spacing, 1.5. And I want you to write it in Filipino. You may use English for technical terms, but write it in Filipino. Why? Because again, as I've said before, a translation is already an interpretation. An interpretation is somehow a higher cognitive uh, activity than just parroting or copying whatever is written. So when you translate it into Filipino, you somehow try to uh, express it in your own words. No? So the sources are, of course, the Bible Project videos I already showed you, and this lecture. Hindi niyo na po kailangan maghanap ng ibang sources, but you may do so if you want. But the main sources will be, of course, the videos I sent you. And if I read them, I will be able to identify if you took from the videos or you just copy-paste from the internet. So submission is on Wednesday, February 10, next week. So I will be very strict on this. I expect all your papers to be sent through, of course, our web Facebook page as a private message. So it's in Microsoft Word format. So I just want you to describe the development of the understanding of the Messiah based on your understanding of our lecture today and the Bible Project videos. So this is the first installment of your essay. So next week I will I will ask you to write another essay which is be which will be a continuation of this essay. 